So hi, everybody. My name is Terry Rogaway, and I'm with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. And uh, I've been with this agency for about 16 years now. And I wanted to thank you for all of your help in allowing us to become and grow into the agency that we are today that allows us to protect the wildlife so that you can come and see it and enjoy it. And for both myself and Michelle, wildlife is one of our favorite things. And so this program today is called Wild About Wildlife, and it's a virtual adventure. And it's going to focus mostly in Coyote Valley for, for the most part, but we wanted to share some of our favorite animals with you. Oops. <laughs> Find the buttons, right? Oh, no. So before I get started, I wanted to say that we acknowledge that the Open Space Authority works within lands that were originally stewarded by the Waswas, Chichenyo, Mutsun, and Tamian speaking peoples. Today, we are honored to partner with the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band and the Moekma Ohlone Tribal Band of the San Francisco Bay Area in our shared work to protect and restore the environment and connect people to the land. Are you wild about wildlife just like we are? Are you, are you? Do you love nature? Do you love wildlife? Yay, you came to the right place. But what is wildlife? What is wildlife, right? Hmm. My cat, who is very, very fat by the way, is not wildlife, no, no. And the reason for that is that wildlife, um, as we consider it, is those are animals that live in open spaces and like out in nature and they rely on nature's resources. If they are um, fed by humans, animals can become domesticated <laughs> or habituated to people, which is not a good thing if they're wild animals. So um, we must resist that urge no matter how cute they might look. But, um, but for the sake of this program today, Animals that rely on nature's resources only and are not fed by humans would be considered wildlife. So we have different kinds of wildlife. And, and when you're hiking out in the preserves, because they're nature preserves and because we don't have um, like dogs and things like that to change the scent of the area, you have a really good chance of getting to see some of this wildlife. But um, we wanted to share some with you today that are the kind that you totally could see like every time and some that you might see seasonally like certain times of the year and some that you might not ever see it at all or once in a lifetime like special experiences and things like that so keep in mind that when you come to the preserves you're actually visiting their home they live here and they need everything that they need to survive has to come from the natural area that they're in that you are visiting during the day so today we'll be talking about some common, uncommon, rare, and endangered species that can be found out in the preserves. Ooh. Raise your hand to yourself if you've ever actually seen these creatures that you see here. I never saw these. I never saw these until I came to work at Open Space. Yay! Woohoo! <laughs> so here's an easy one that I bet you've all seen. California ground squirrels, ground squirrels. They are very common. And you probably see these a lot around your home too, or your neighborhood because they've gotten really used to living in, and I said in because people have been having trouble with them getting in their roof, <laughs> in the dwellings and around homes um, where people are. They're actually very used to us and have adapted to us. And so just because you see them in your yard doesn't mean that they're not wildlife. They're definitely still wild. But these guys are fascinating because they're a key part of the oak woodland ecosystem. And what I mean by that is I love the fact that they're so busy and they run around and they bury their acorns and their different seeds in these little hidden caches all over the place. And they're doing that because they're getting ready for the coming cold season, right? And so they're trying to hide their food everywhere and if they're not busy dealing with their friends stealing their food, which can happen a lot, or other critters stealing their food, sometimes they actually forget where it is. And when that happens, it can grow into a tree. So they're accidental foresters who help us grow trees because they forget where things are. But I can totally relate to that. Can't you? 
<laughs> oh, look at this picture. We have an amazing photographer on our staff. His name is David and and uh, he's really gifted with uh, taking pictures. And I'm like, look at these guys, look at these babies. So it is a baby ground squirrel season. So the ones that were born earlier are now at that really adorable age. And, and so if you go out to the park, you might actually see them um, and they're so cute, but please resist the urge to feed them. The reason that our squirrels are polite is because they don't know what Cheetos are. They don't know. And so um, because of that, when they see us, they go chirp, chirp. And that's where we come to the community alarm system. You've heard of neighborhood watch in your own neighborhood. Well, they have it too. <laughs> So when you go outside and you hear this really high pitch, like chirp, chirp, chirp sound, that's usually the squirrels in our preserves. That means that they're scared of something and they could be scared of you, even though you don't think you're scary. They think that you're scary and that you might want to try to eat them. So they warn each other about everything they see, especially people. But I've noticed that the ones that get used to people will warn each other about other things. So if you want a chance to see like a really cool bobcat or a bird of prey, if you listen to the squirrels and they start chirping, just hold still and look around and try to figure out what scared them. Because it, the chances are you'll get to see something really cool. Just last week, I was at Rancho Cañada del Oro and we heard the squirrels chirping. I'm like, are they scared of us? What's going on? And then a couple moments later, we went around the bend of the little paved loop trail there. And there was a bobcat <laughs> and it was like doo -doo 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 -doo, like taken off away from us so i got to see a bobcat butt it was really fun and but if it wasn't for the squirrels i wouldn't have been alerted that something unusual was there that they were worried about so they're great for helping you spot stuff too so um so yeah these guys will stand up really straight and chirp and they warn each other and when that happens places like rancho cañada del oro or sierra vista when they chirp all of the younger ones go pew and they get underground and so they hide so you have somebody who's like a sentinel who's like a guard who like keeps an eye out and and uh especially like i've noticed when the chirping started mama came up and was looking for the babies like where is everybody <laughs> and she immediately ran over to like try to shoo them underground so the parents do a good job of trying to teach them you know to survive Ooh, trigger alert really big spiders <laughs> this says uncommon and the reason it says uncommon is because most of the year you like never see them um but you will see them towards the end of summer and you will see these tarantulas in the fall so it's kind of fun it like leads up to halloween <laughs> creepy crawlies so we have um, tarantulas that live in our preserves and they're about like this big. That's like with their legs as much as their body, okay? But they're like this big. And, and when you see them, they're like, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. thankfully, most of the time they just go slow. If they were like, pew, 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 I might have to faint because I'm not used to that. But what happens is they go really slow and you know, their bodies are so different from ours. Like their legs, they don't have very many muscles at all. We use muscles to move our legs and they really don't. It turns out they have like hydraulics. So they will have really thin blood that almost it can't clot like ours does. So if they get injured, they could die very quickly. So they have to be careful. But what they do is they push blood into their leg and it extends. And that's how they take a step. And then they have a little tiny muscle right here that pulls the leg back. So they're pushing fluid in, pulling it back, pushing fluid in, pulling it back eight times <laughs> with their eight legs. So it takes quite a bit of coordination to move all that liquid around their body and to coordinate those muscles to bring the legs back in so that they can walk. So most of the time, they're just kind of going slow, looking for bugs and things like that. But here's the weird thing. If you look at those pictures, where are their eyes? on the top of their body. Most of the time when they're eating things, they're eating stuff that's underneath them. So if your eyes are only looking up, how are you finding stuff that's underneath you? You can't even see it. Isn't that crazy? Well, look at these hairy legs. These legs have also special hairs that stick out a little bit longer. There's little finer ones that we don't see that much. You can sort of see it in the middle picture. 
but they have these special hairs that sense motion and moisture and things like that. So they'll be walking along and they're looking up for danger, like from the sky, like is there a bird's gonna eat them or something like that. But they're walking along and through the bottom of their feet and all of those hairs on their legs, they sense emotion and they stop. And then they, then they can move very quickly to pinpoint because they have eight legs that are all sensing at the same time. They can pinpoint where the cricket is and grab it. And, I, and I've actually seen tarantulas dig all of a sudden really frantically like dig, 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 dig and grab like a little worm. So they've done that before too. So they can sense amazing things with the underside of their body and their legs. They don't just depend on their eyesight to be able to see their food. Pretty fascinating. And so most of the boys live maybe two to four years, something like that, you know, only long enough really to be able to reproduce. But the females can live upwards of like 30 years. Yeah. And so you might ask yourself, you know, why is that, right? How come the girls live so long and the boys don't live so long? Well, the boys live long enough to find romance. And most of the time when they find the romance, the romance eats them. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so as soon as they get done reproducing or, or meeting a female, they'll, you know, if she's, they don't get out of the way fast enough, she'll eat them. That totally happens. So their lifespan is pretty short. But um, the other thing is, if you look at their abdomen, so the last part of their body, these guys look really healthy and not stressed out. Sometimes you'll see them and they have like a bald spot on the back of their body. That's because they have these urticating hairs. It's kind of like imagine if you had tiny little spears stuck all over your body that was part of you and if somebody scared you you could reach up and grab it and go Whoosha! and throw it at somebody <laughs> that's what they do with the hairs on their rear end so um they actually will they have two ways they can do it they can grab it and flick it with their legs so they can throw these little spear-like hairs at a bird's eyes they aim for the eyes and they like try to blind things that way the other thing they can do is if they get really freaked out they kind of go and they inflate really quickly and the hairs go and they fly out in like a little hail of these little urticating hairs. So they can do that too. So if you see them and they have a bald spot, it's because they had some stressful times where they thought somebody was going to eat them and they had to defend themselves. So that's one way that they do it. But this is just so you know, this is what it looks like when tarantulas are mating. It's not like you would think. And they kind of like hold hands like that. And part of what happens is the male, um, right away, he reaches up and he grabs the female's fangs and he holds on to them because she might change her mind and decide she doesn't like him anymore. And if she does, she'll eat him. So he has to hold on to her fangs. And then he, she has a pocket and he has pockets on his legs that he, he takes the things to make babies and he takes that out and he puts it in her pocket. And then the second he's done, he runs for his life. <laughs> so if you're out at the park in the fall, you might actually see the grass going. And if you listened very carefully, you could almost hear a little spider going. Oh! <laughs> because he's running away from the females so that she won't eat him. So amazing life. If you ever feel bad about your romantic life, just be glad you're not a male tarantula. Ooh. Oh, by the way, if you want to see tarantulas in the fall, they are the most active towards the end of the day. So right before it gets dark, they do walk around in the dark too. But if you want to see them in the fall, we usually do programs around four o'clock, four or five o'clock in the late afternoon like that. And we have a really good chance of getting to see them. So keep your eyes peeled on our calendar and you could get to come see them in the park. And you can even go for a walk with Paul, who's amazing. Oh. <gasps> Badgers! Badger, badger, badger! I have actually never seen a badger in the wild, but I have seen a lot of badger dens. So we do have holes. Check out this body. Don't they look powerful? These guys don't look nearly as cranky as they get their reputation for being. Not cranky at all. So, um, <laughs> so the deal with these guys is that they're mostly nocturnal, but not always. And they tend to be very... Um, much loners so they hang out on their own they'll get together to mate with a female 
and then she takes off and she's pregnant and the daddy doesn't stick around for that she's like okay that's enough of that and so she leaves him and goes and and has a den and will like raise the babies on her own but look at those powerful claws they can really dig so they don't need a squirrel hole to start their den that just makes it easier if they find one but they can actually dig really powerful holes but the way to tell is when you see them the holes are kind of like it looks like a giant cheeseburger <laughs> it's kind of like that shape where it's wide and squat like that because that's you can see their body kind of spreads out like that and and that's what they do so they get down really low and they crawl in like that and they're fiercely protective of things like their food so if they're eating something and somebody else comes, like a, another animal comes and tries to take it, they're in for a fight. These guys are very tenacious when it comes to protecting their own territory, like their home or their food. So that's where they get the reputation, like, don't badger me, don't badger me, because the badgers don't give up. <laughs> they're like, give me back my food, and then we'll go after you. And so that's why another reason, you know, to respect the wildlife and don't, look too closely in the badger hole just kind of look from a distance and go oh that's cool and i will tell you that if you come visit some of our preserves even pretty close to the parking lots you might actually get to see a badger if you come towards the end of the day and you're just quiet and you just hang out and watch the hillsides you might actually get to see some of the ones that we have living there so really interesting thing to see i found out that they're part of the I'm going to mess this up. Mustela Day, Mustela Day family. And I'm like, what? Who's that? It turns out that's otters. Otters and, and different kinds of weasels and things like that. Look at this guy looking out of this hole. He's like, what's going on? Oh, no. And, and uh, they're just such powerful, short, stubby little bodies um, low to the ground and things like that. But the other thing that's really fun is if you get the chance, go on YouTube and look up the coyote and the badger. Because some couple of years ago, we had an incident where they it got caught on camera <laughs> that that sometimes coyotes and badgers work together. So what they'll do is they both like to eat squirrels. So they'll go in. Oh no, poor squirrels! Right. So the coyote will go in one squirrel hole and start digging, and the badger will go to the other door, like which is probably the back entrance to the squirrel's hole, and start digging. So they're both going, cha, 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 making lots of noise. And the squirrel inside is going, oh, ah, running back and forth. And then what happens is then the squirrel is going to get caught by somebody. So whoever gets it gets lucky. And, and so somehow these creatures have learned that they're more successful when they work together. That does not mean they share the squirrel. They don't share the squirrel. But they have a better chance of getting food if they work together. So in that video on YouTube, you can actually see a coyote that's jumping around and he looks all cute and happy and puppy like. And then all of a sudden, I was not expecting that. You're like, you'll see the badger. <laughs> so he made a friend like the wildlife. They made friends and they actually did that. So you got to see that. It's really cool. Go check it out. OK. <laughs> these guys were new for me too when I came to open space to like um I still haven't seen a burrowing owl in the wild but I bet you probably have and didn't realize it so um especially in the winter time a lot of burrowing owls will migrate back through Santa Clara County and they will stop in a lot of our open spaces in order to nest and and so they spend the winter with us that's the time to go see them and these are the only owls that we have that are awake in the daytime on purpose like they're diurnal that's their that's their time is daytime and so they're little they have really long legs <laughs> and and they're very alert and they eat things like grasshoppers and they do eat mice if they can get a hold of them but mice are nocturnal so they will go after things like gophers and things like that and they love to eat bugs and frogs and little snakes and things so they'll do stuff like that and, and they'll run around and do that to get food and so what I meant by you've probably seen them and didn't realize is that a lot of times at dusk you might see a bird of prey flying around someplace like Sierra Vista you could be up there watching the beautiful sunset and these birds are flying by and if you really look at them when they're flying if you look at the bird in the front of its head, it's kind of like this. 
Most birds have a beak, right? <laughs> it sticks out in the front. Burrowing owls don't. Their head is, is like round. So when they fly, it's like a blunt. So if you've seen that, you've probably seen them and didn't even realize. So you should go up and you should take a look and see if the ones that you see flying around have a rounded head instead of a beak because you could be actually seeing them going out hunting before they go to sleep for the night but definitely winter season everybody i know who's seen them has seen them in the winter um, places like coyote valley all up and down coyote valley and sierra vista and places like that you can actually sneak a peek <laughs> extreme hole makeover <laughs> look at that hey if you look really closely at that hole over there past this guy who's looking at us right here you can actually see that's human made so um people are in the process right now of learning what burrowing owls need in order to be healthier and the reason for that is because we really only have about two million burrowing owls left and i know that sounds like a lot but it's not considering how dangerous their life is out in the wild. And right now we think that we only have about maybe 10,000 breeding pairs. And that's like everywhere. So um, in our area, the population has really been dramatically going down. So we're trying to figure out how we can help them, help them survive. And, and so one of the ways that we can do that is we can create a burrow for them that maybe they really like it and maybe it's in an area that will be um, sort of like off limits where they won't be harassed by anything and they have a better chance to be successful but in the wild what they will do um, if they're not using our help is they actually move into squirrel holes so they'll go into squirrel dens and they'll dig them out a little bit bigger and they'll make their burrow in there and and uh, they're funny because they like to collect stuff <laughs> so they'll find like little shiny things and and the other thing is that if they get really frightened, they will um, run into the burrow and make these little rattling noises. So they actually sound like a rattlesnake. And that's intended to like scare predators away from them. So um, you might actually hear them, you know, doing something like that if they get frightened. Ooh. Bay checker spot butterflies, extremely endangered. If you have ever seen them, you would know that these little bitty butterflies about the size of a quarter, a little bit bigger than a quarter, these guys look like they're made out of stained glass. They're just gorgeous. And right now we only have them on Mayano Yakma Coyote Ridge. So uh, you'll get the chance this spring to get to come out and get your butterfly pass and get to come out and go for hikes and have guides if you want guides with you and get a chance to see some of these. And you really should, because these are endemic to California. It's like they only live here and they only live here in maybe one other place in all of Santa Clara County. And the thing I find fascinating about them is that they don't migrate. So like right now when everything's dry and there's no flowers and there's nothing to eat, they're still there. They're just disguised. So they're living as a caterpillar and they're basically asleep until the weather changes and things get moist and, and their body can sense when there's enough moisture to potentially have food for them to eat. And so they'll sleep. Can you imagine that if you could sleep until you smelled breakfast? <laughs> and then you'd wake up and go, oh, there's cereal or something like that. It's kind of like that. So you'll get the chance. You'll get the chance this spring to come up to Mayano Yakma Coyote Ridge and get to see these guys. And um, very exclusive uh, chance for them to be seen. So these larvae, this, this little tiny flower that he's on right here, it, it's like the size of like, a. it looks like a Q-tip, not the flower, the Q-tip. I found there's actually a flower called a Q-tip, but it looks like a Q-tip. And, and it's called a dwarf plantain. And so the bay checker spot butterflies they only lay their eggs on these they can eat a whole bunch of different flowers in the springtime they can drink the nectar from those but for their babies they only lay them at the base so it's kind of like you have this cute little flower that sticks up that looks like a q-tip and these tiny little blades of grass and we've actually had people film it before where the caterpillar will climb up to the edge of the grass and just go nom, 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 nom. 
and eat it all the way down to the end. And then they crawl up the other blade of grass and do it again. So they do that and, and they'll have to grow and go into a chrysalis and, and emerge again as a bigger caterpillar. And then they go back to sleep and they come out again as a bigger caterpillar. And they have to do that like five times before they become a butterfly in the spring. So what a remarkable life that they must have. And they really need these plants in order to survive. So that's a lot of what we do on Mayano Yakma Coyote Ridge is we protect this landscape so that these plants will be there so that these butterflies will be there. Not just the butterflies, but other endangered animals too. So we look forward to getting you to come out and, and see this. And, and the thing is that this dwarf plantain only does really well in a serpentine soil which if you come visit us you'll learn that serpentine soil is really horrible soil like almost nothing can grow in it but these little plants manage to and these butterflies manage to need these plants that gives us a lot of responsibility to allow these you know situations to be healthy so that these animals can continue to live thank you for helping us with that by the way it's because of you that we're able to do these things Hey, can you see him? Can you see me now? No, I can't. <laughs> you see the bobcat? Oh, there it is. Look for the signs. It's okay. Sometimes when we do programs and we go for hikes, we don't actually see any wildlife. It depends on if it's too hot or we're making too much noise or things like that. But you can find signs of them. So you can find tracks. You can find scat. Sometimes we find hair or different things like that. So keep an eye out. You can see different hints and clues. This is Michelle. And Michelle wanted me to tell you how you can help wildlife. So you can help wildlife by um, being respectful guests when you come to visit the preserve. And that means like, you'll notice a lot of our preserves don't have garbage cans. And that's on purpose because we don't want the wildlife to figure out what Cheetos are or human food is and become dependent on that. So if you take your trash home with you, um, then they don't have that danger of eating trash or finding out what human food is and getting away from the things they should be eating. So that helps us a lot. And the second most helpful thing for, for wildlife is to stay on the trail when you visit. I know it can be tempting to like go off trail and explore, but staying on the trail allows the wildlife to set up their home in the rest of the land. It's kind of like a living classroom or a living um, like it's you know because of the landscape so if you stay on the trail it helps them be much more successful the other thing that you can do is i don't know if you've heard of iNaturalist but it's a free app that you can download so you can join this huge community of people that are citizen scientists and that means that you can take pictures of things that you see around your neighborhood or when you come visit the park you can take pictures of things and it's a living record of everything that everybody's seen and so that app by Naturalist has all these people that are official, like they're, they're sort of like enthusiasts and experts about all of these plants and animals and rocks and everything. And so you can go, what, what is this thing? <laughs> you can post it on there and they'll tell you. And not only that, but it records the GPS coordinates of where you saw it. So then your observation gets recorded for all of posterity. So someday, you can show your grandchildren all of the things that you found while you were walking in our preserves. And we'll be able to track over time how those populations are doing. And we'll say, hey, remember the day, hopefully we're not saying that, remember the day when there used to be burrowing owls? Look, there were all these sightings at this location. Hopefully we'll say, remember the days when we were worried about burrowing owls and getting a sighting was very rare. Now look how many there are. That's the future that I would hope for. So, but also don't forget about wildlife in your own backyard. So if you have native plants, you'll notice you have a lot more birds that come through. Um, if you're careful and you don't use things like pesticides, you'll have a lot more um, amphibians. You could have frogs and toads and things and, and different creatures will come and be healthier because of that, if that's possible for you. And the other thing is just remember our human impact. So it can be tempting when you're driving through Coyote Valley to go really fast. I was out there this morning and people were just whooshing by me 
And I was like, oh, oh, and I was a little scared. <laughs> but the thing is, the reason I drive slow is because I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to accidentally hit an animal that gets startled and tries to run across the road. So if you pay attention and you're just aware that sometimes speeding can cause animals like birds can run into your car, the side of your car, or you can accidentally hit something. You know, if you want to be a responsible person for wildlife and you love wildlife like we do, you can um, slow down a little bit when you're driving through areas that have wildlife and things like that. So now what I'd like to do is I'll just take a look really quick. And I see that uh, Julie has a question. She says, how do the ground squirrels react when the burrowing owls take over their holes? Are the holes abandoned? Oh my goodness. Um, so if they're still in there, they freak out. But the good news is that a lot of times squirrels have whole sections. So it's not really just like a one room apartment. It's like a whole condo with intersecting doors. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes what I've heard of squirrels doing is actually going into a section that doesn't have the owl and backfilling it. <laughs> so they'll like push dirt in front of the way so that the, the owl can't get to them. And then they continue to live in the rest of the burrow so they can do that too. But they are in a sense on the plate. They're a little bit big for burrowing owls to take, but, but they could if they really wanted to and they really tried. So they, they uh, don't necessarily share the same exact space, but, but they, do, um, they, they do get displaced sometimes by the burrowing owls if that happens. Okay, so how many checker spot butterflies were found in Coyote Ridge this spring? Did the rainy weather affect their habitat? So these are really good questions. And what I'm gonna do is write your name down here. And what I will do, is I'm gonna to talk to our Bay Checker Spot experts that we have in our community and find out some of our docents are also part of other groups that actually go out and count the butterfly larva. And if you're curious in the winter time and towards the end of winter, like January, sometimes February, you can actually go with them and help count. So you can get a sense of how many butterflies we might actually get this year. So you could do it. But in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll ask them, hey, what, what's your latest information? And, and uh, see what people like Stu Weiss from Creekside Science has to say, and Craig Edgerton, who's, who's also been very involved on the ridge and loves Bay Checker Spot butterflies too. So I'll ask them and um, I will let you know. Okay, so we will find a way, we'll either um, email it to everybody that was signed up for this, or we can see about a Twitter post or something like that. Okay, so that's what I'll do to um, make sure that you get that information. So uh, Vicki was asking, where can we have the biggest chance of finding badgers? So um, what I would do is I would go to places like, let's see, I'm trying to think of ones that are open. You can go for a hike at Sierra Vista Open Space Preserve, take water with you. It, and there are certain parts of it that are really steep. so. Um, until you get used to it, I would stay on the, the smaller trail. <laughs> I'm not a super hiker, so <laughs> I'm a stop and stare at everything and get distracted by everything kind of hiker. So I tend to use the smaller trails like the Aquila Loop and, and things like that that are right across from the parking lot. But you can go and you can just um, go for hikes towards the end of the day or first thing in the morning and just take your cup of coffee or whatever and go for a walk and enjoy and just be quiet and you'll that's when you'll notice them so either like right before it gets dark or um first thing in the morning is when they've been spotted by staff um at, at various locations but i know that they've seen them at sierra vista and i know they've been seen um at mayano yakma coyote ridge and then i don't know about the actual location for coyote valley so we'll have to check for that and we're also careful because Sometimes people get over enthusiastic and we don't want to um, cause a problem for them. But yeah, check it out. And Ron's asking, what other kinds of squirrels can you see and how do you tell them apart? Well, there are tree squirrels. For me, there's tree squirrels and ground squirrels. The ground squirrels are the ones that we saw in this, in this um, presentation and they tend to be big robust bodies and kind of scrappy looking tails and I think it's probably because they roll around in the dirt a lot they go underground or it's kind of like your hairdo would get messed up you know if you're constantly diving underground and 
But the tree squirrels are the ones that are a little bit more reddish in color. Some of them are black. You have some black ones that are melanated and they have big, beautiful, fluffy tails. And that's because they're not in the dirt. <laughs> they're up in the tree. And when they go to sleep, they wrap their tail around them. So they're very fluffy and floofy looking. So you can see those. And then we have chipmunks. <laughs> so we have Miriam's chipmunks um, that are actually at Rancho Cañada del Oro. So if you go in the morning and you go up the Mayfair Trail on those little switchbacks, um, especially when the manzanita berries are there, you'll hear this weird little and the first time I heard that, I was like, what kind of bird is that? And I was looking at the bushes going, what? I can't even see where that, oh. <laughs> and there was like 15 of them. And they're adorable. I mean, they make squirrels look like Job of the Hut. <laughs> they're these little beady things and they have these little stripes going down their back and they're just adorable. And they'll get a hold of a manzanita berry and it looks like a, like a toddler trying to eat a watermelon. You know, it's just adorable. So you can see them at Rancho Cadillac de Oro too. <laughs> thanks ron let's see um okay so what is the best preserve for possibly viewing mountain lions and bobcats so we actually have a bobcat that's been hanging out around the meadow at rancho canyana del oro that's where i saw one last week um i've commonly seen bobcats and, and i haven't seen a mountain lion in in the wild yet i've seen steaming scat <laughs> i'm like I don't know where it went, but this is right here. <laughs> so we do have mountain lions in all of our preserves. They are crepuscular. They like to be awake in the nighttime. And they, they, they're, they, the food they eat, I should say, is crepuscular, which means dawn and dusk is when they're awake. Their cheeseburger, their pizza, you know, that's deer. They love to eat deer. And deer walk around at those times of day. So that's when the mountain lions will be following them and like trying to catch a deer in order to feed themselves. And if they have young like that too. So um, what I would recommend is get yourself one of those yard duty whistles. Remember that from when you were a kid, <laughs> don't run. <laughs> you can put the whistle around your neck. And if you're nervous, just have it around your neck. It's also helpful if you ever got hurt like fell off the trail and you needed to call somebody and you were worried your voice was going to give out if you have a whistle you can blow it just by breathing so it's a good idea to have a whistle with you at all times but if you did see a mountain lion and and you got startled you could blow your whistle really loud and cats don't like shrill noises they really don't so it would startle them and they would run but you would have a chance that you could get to see them and we do have them in all of our preserves. And, and so if you would like, um, we don't go out on programs specifically to see mountain lions because we don't have that kind of tracking or, or those kinds of programs, but um, we do do some night hikes and evening hikes and things like that. But when we do, it's by reservation and we're all together and we have whistles and lights and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I think for you, just you're fascinated by them and you want to see them dawn and dusk is the time when they're around and you know just stay stay with other people and and just be aware that they are wild animals and that they need everything that they need to live you know from the wild so just be careful okay be careful. but bobcats tons of bobcats i've seen them actually i've seen them in all three of the preserves yeah so Sierra Vista for sure a lot also in Alam Rock Park like a lot in Alam Rock and that's because Alam Rock Park has a bazillion squirrels so there's also a really big fat bobcat that lives on the trail that goes down into Alam Rock Park and he is I don't know how he got so fat because he seems so lazy his the park rangers there used to call him Bruno because he would sit there and he would just stare <laughs> but he must hunt a lot to get that big but um, but yeah, he looks kind of fierce looking, but he's really just staring at people as they go by type stuff. Um, so you can see one at Alam Rock Park and I have seen them like, and I've even seen them in the meadow at Rancho Cañada del Oro. And I've seen joggers run right past them and the cat will just lay down because they don't want to be seen. <laughs> they're just like, oops. And they kind of squat down and the person's like, don't, 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 and they don't even notice. 
And then as soon as the guy's gone, the cat will come back up and be like, oh, because they're trying to eat the squirrels too. Thank you so much. Let's see, how many parks are part of the Open Space Authority? So right now we have Sierra Vista, which is in the north end above Alum Rock Park. So Sierra Vista, Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve, uh, Rancho Cañada del Oro Open Space Preserve, which is back behind Calero uh, County Park. And soon we will be having Mayano Yakma Coyote Ridge that will become open um, probably in the fall. And you'll be able to go there and check that park out all the time, not just in the spring. So that's exciting and that's coming. We're working very hard to make that happen. We're just tying up some loose ends before we can do that. So, but those are the preserves that are open. We also have properties that are not yet open. And that doesn't mean you can't visit them. You just need to go with us because they don't have any infrastructure. So we'll have open access days at places like Diablo Foothills South, which is down by, um, there's Diablo Foothills South and around the corner from there is Palisou Ridge. And so both of those are down in South, um, South County. And we open those up so you can hike at your own pace and go explore and check it out. We have little maps and stuff. So we do those on certain weekends every year to give you access. But sometimes you can also go with us to places like the Blair Ranch, which is the back end of Rancho Cañada del Oro. And that's due to be open later this year, if not um, early next year. We're going to build a bridge across from the Rancho Meadow, and you'll be able to walk across and go explore that too. So you can go into some of these preserves and places like Little Uvis Creek is a beautiful little property with ponds and these horses that think they're dogs. <laughs> so you can go there. So just keep an eye on our website and you can sign up for programs that are there. And if it ever happens that you want to go to a program and it says it's sold out, please just email us. Hit the contact us. It says in, info at openspaceauthority.org and say, hey, I really wanted to go to this. Is there any chance I could go to this? And when people really want to go, a lot of times we, we let you in because we do have people that mean well, but they get excited. They click the button and then and then they forget. <laughs> And we're like, oh, man, people wanted to come. So if you contact us and say you wanted to come, we'll let you in and you can come. OK, so don't worry about that kind of thing. So just because a property is closed doesn't mean you can't go there. You just go with us when we do a program or we send a guide with you and your family and things like that. And we do that based on availability of volunteers and staff. OK, so thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you coming out. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day and have a safe weekend and uh, take care and nice to see you, Dave. I saw you there and, and uh, we will see you all soon out in the preserves. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.